greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our chats with Emily as we're calling our readings through the poems of Emily Dickinson contained in the Johnson edition. We turn now to poem 118, My Friend Attacks My Friend. And I will say right away that this might be one of the darkest poems that Emily Dickinson ever wrote. I find it fascinating how the majority of the important scholars of Emily Dickinson have not really treated this poem. And I think one of the reasons is because it has one of the most disturbing lines in all of Emily's poetry. And I would say in all of poetry. And it's not really clear how to take it. If you take it literally, then this is without question going to show us just how dark Emily's uh, Emily's mind can go to some pretty dark places. Now, I think some readers have said, she's Emily, she's being tongue-in-cheek. There will be other readers that will read this poem and say that this is the prophetic Emily, that she is writing this poem just months before the beginning of the American Civil War, and that Emily understood something was about to happen truly tragic. And when I use this term tragic, that will be significant, because I think this poem brilliantly moves from the comic to the tragic, and, uh, and we'll, be, we'll be taking a look at it here in a moment. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Chats with Emily, again, our playlist. My hope is that, A, you have been already exposed to our set of introductory comments about Emily, and then, B, I'm very hopeful that you've already read the previous 117 poems we just finished with in Rags Mysterious. And the reason I say that is because a poem like this I believe, cannot be read in isolation. In fact, when people come to the end of this poem, they, if they don't have the background of, of their study of Emily's poetry, they can be very quickly disturbed by this poem. Now, there's no question. This is a poem about conflict resolution. No question. And it does move from the comic to the, uh, and, and the petty to the tragic. And I could even argue the apocalyptic. We'll see how we read it. It's clear that Emily is concerned with um, aggressiveness, with aggression, with fighting. There's going to be a, a lot of martial language here. There's five times in this brief poem that the, that the uh, exclamation point is used. Um, and there's no dashes in this poem. It's fascinating. There's no pauses. It's like, it's almost as if this poem runs onto itself in getting to this final disturbing line. Now, we're going to argue that I think there's a, something biblical standing behind. I said apocalyptic a second ago. Something biblical standing behind. I think the Genesis 6 Noah story is clearly in the mind of Emily Dickinson as she writes this thing. Well, you'll remember that the, uh, the, the famous passage, and, it would be, and I'll read it to you in the King James Version because that's the version that she would know from Genesis 6, 6, and 7. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And then verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. I think this idea stands behind this poem. We'll see if, we'll see if, it, if it works for you guys. Um, now, we're going to be talking about friends attacking friends. But it isn't clear in the poem who those friends are. Okay, so that will be significant as well. And again, the fact that Emily is writing this poem, think about it. This is 1859, we believe this poem was written. And on the 12th of April, 1861, of course, the horrific Civil War breaks out. Of all the poems we've read to this point, I think this poem probably speaks more to our time and place now than any other poem that we've read of Emily's thus far. You guys decide if it works for you. Let's enjoy the poem. My friend attacks my friend. Oh, battle, picturesque. Then I turn soldier too, and he turns satirist. How martial is this place? Had I a mighty gun, I think I'd shoot the human race, and then to glory run. Now, right, right. I mean, dude, did we just read a line that said, had I a mighty gun? I think I'd shoot the human race and then to glory run? We did. That is what she wrote. Now again, some have played this off as 
Emily being Emily with her ironic voice and all of that. A simple reading of this is simple. I got into a thing between two of my friends and very quickly I got sucked into it and it turned into insanity. I wish I could just get rid of the whole thing of conflict between humans by just getting rid of the whole human race. Obviously she's speaking hyperbolic, exaggerated, and to that degree, let's not take her seriously. But I think there is something actually pretty serious about this poem. And I think this is, guys, this is the reason that we love Emily so much. And we're disturbed by Emily so much. And I, as I said in my introductory set of comments, one of the reasons that we're working through these poems is uh, the great uh, literary critiquer Bloom said about Emily, she just disturbs me in so many ways. I just, I often can't, I, I can't know how to read her. And we, we took that challenge from Bloom and we said, Let's read these poems and try and figure out, every single one of them in the Johnson edition, what actually is, is going on. This is one of those poems that really is disturbing, I think, on a number of levels. My friend attacks my friend. By the way, note the tense. It's not my friend attacked my friend, as she often will do, writing in the past tense. This is very much an immediate. My friend attacks my friend. Again, who? We don't know. Background? We don't know. Who are these friends? We don't know. But what if we think about the word friend as brother? And now all of a sudden, the idea of brother attacking brother. We're back, of course, to the book of Genesis and especially the Cain and Abel motif before, obviously, we get to Genesis 6 and Noah. My friend attacks my friend. Oh, battle, picturesque. Now, it's interesting that she would use the word picturesque because it kind of makes the battle seem trivial and silly in some profound ways. And then, I turn soldier too. Notice again all the military language here. I turn soldier too. In other words, my friends were fighting, and then I got involved. And I thought I could probably solve this problem. In other words, I turned soldier too. And he, it's interesting the pronoun he gets used, not she, right? He turns satirist. Now, you know, obviously satirist here is, is going to be, I mean, hard to interpret. What does she mean by this? In other words, they made fun, the, my, my friend made fun of me, he made fun of me when I got involved in this. I know I can solve this problem, I know I can, and then of course the satire, you know, the irony starts to build. And then we get to this word martial. How martial is this place? Notice the exclamation points. Again, we got, as, as we said at the very beginning, right, we've got a total of five of these in a very brief set of lines. Five of these. It's like, and it's just like, can I say, since she referenced the gun, it's like bullets you know, it's coming right at us with these exclamation points. How martial this place. Now, of course, note the, note the use of the word place. We can be talking about a physical place, we can be talking about a metaphysical place, conflict, obviously, and the conflict resolution that she's longing for. How martial is this place? In other words, all of a sudden, she starts out kind of watching this battle picturesque, and all of a sudden, here she is in the middle of it. Now, of course, for those who love to read Emily as one of the great American prophets of all prophets, Think about the power of the Battle of Bull Run and how so many people came out to watch that picturesque battle with their, what did they, what do they tell us? With, our, with their picnic baskets, they're going to watch that battle, which ultimately, of course, ends up almost being the end of the war before it even gets started as they, you know, start to march towards uh, the this, this Southern Confederacy. Rebels start to march towards, uh, you know, the city of D.C. How martial is this place? And then... Uh, and by the way, now we're, getting, now we're getting to the end of the poem and we find ourselves with this hypothetical that some are going to call, yeah, okay, this is hyperbole, but how do you know that? And she says it, had I a, notice it's a mighty gun, right? Um, and this idea of mighty, go back to Poem 60 to see the game that's being played there. Had I a mighty gun, and she's going to use this word gun in several other poems, 172, 175, 277, 474, and then finally, the, and most importantly, uh, My Life Had Stood a, a Loaded Gun, 754. We'll, we'll study that one in a little bit. Had I a mighty gun, I think I'd shoot the human race. Human race, as a phrase, gets used one and only one time in all of her poetry, and it's right here. And then, to glory run. Many have read this even darker. She says, I wish I could just annihilate all humans with a huge gun, a mighty gun, and then I'd off myself as well and leave for glory. Of course, it's problematic that she uses the word glory here because 
glory in what way? Who would celebrate the end of the human race because of conflict resolution? And again, now you're forced to have to read this poem. This is the genius of Emily, right? You're forced to read this poem in one of two ways. This is either, I got involved in some stupidity with my friends. I just wish, you know, somehow we could just make all of this go away. If, they, if we could just make the human race somehow evaporate, we wouldn't have these silly conflicts all the time. <sighs> Joking. Or, is she really fundamentally frustrated? Is she really channeling the story of the Noah passage that we already have read? In other words, there comes a moment in time when even deity repents himself in the passage of creating humans. Why? Because humans are always engaged in this conflict, in this horrific conflicts. Well, I think at 2A that her argument is that it's always hard. Conflict resolution is always hard. Especially when you've got friends, dare we say brothers, who are involved. And in that regards, we think often that we can step in and solve these conflicts from the outside looking in. The conflicts always look silly. They almost look comic in the traditional comic meaning of that. Like silly, petty, trivial. And then once we get involved, we go, oh, this is not so. Oh, this is not so. <sighs> this is not so easy. And the moment that we come in and we inject ourselves in, we have to somehow feel like we got to take sides. Or even if we don't want to take sides, we've taken a side, right? And then all of a sudden, now we're pulled in. And again, some of you are saying, ooh, this poem speaks so well to conflicts within our current political situations in America and, of course, extended to the world. We're thinking now, of course, about all of the different conflicts all over the globe that are happening right now as I, as I give this set of comments in uh, April of 2024. Mm. At 2B, notice all the quote-unquote war language, the martial language. Did you see it? Attack, battle, soldier, martial, gun, shoot. And then, of course, the word glory. And... It's hyperbolic the way she uses the word glory, right? Notice the movement here to be. Notice the movement from the comic and the silly to the tragic and, dare I say it, the apocalyptic. I mean, I will use that language. It seems almost apocalyptic. Well, again, where, where, where are we going to go? Well, I think one of the places that we have to go um, is, is to set us up to the study of poem 754. Now, we're, we're going to spend a lot of time on 754. Ironically, scholars love to talk about 754. And, and in fact, one of the great biographers of, uh, of Emily will use uh, this line to title his book, Gordon's book. Uh, and, and they completely leave poem 118 alone. When we get to 754, we will come back to poem 118. My life had stood a loaded gun in corners till a day the owner passed, identified and carried me away. And now we roam in sovereign woods, and now we hunt the doe. And every time I speak from the mountain's straight reply, and do I smile such cordial light upon the valley glow? It is a Vesuvian face had let its pleasures through. And when at night our good day done, I guard my master's head. Tis better than the eider duck's deep pillow so have shared. To foe of his I'm deadly foe, None stir the second time on whom I lay a yellow eye or an emphatic thumb. Though I, then he, may longer live, no longer must, than I. For I have but the power to kill without the power to die. Now, there's a whole lot going on in that poem. It's one of Emily's most provocative poems. But let's do point out the violence that's contained within the poem. At 3A... I like to think as well of Milton's Paradise Lost that stands a whole lot behind. As I've said before to you guys, I think Milton has a lot to say for Emily Dickinson, and I think the idea of the tension that is inevitable. When you read Milton's Paradise Lost, you cannot help, as we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net, and as I say in those lectures, we cannot help but know what's coming in terms of the stories that are coming. What are the stories that will come as soon as Adam and Eve are jettisoned from paradise. Uh, well, yeah, they, they have two sons who end up you know, um, having conflict, and of course Cain kills Abel. And then of course just a few verses later we have the apocalyptic vision of Noah's flood 
and we've read that passage already. Think about all the apocalyptic texts that as well can work here. I'm thinking now, of course, about R.E.M.'s classic from 1987, It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine. Both, not only the song, but also the video that accompanied that, and you can run that to ground. Finally, at 3B, what was a time that you struggled with conflict resolution? Maybe you injected yourself into two friends who were fighting or whatever, and, um, you know, you yourself got pulled in. Of course, how do you read this poem is another 3B question for you. How do you read this controversial line about shooting the human race? Have you yourself had feelings like this? And how do you think Emily is dealing with this? And of course, the amazing brilliance of writing this just a few hours before the tragic Civil War. Thank you.